This meeting right. is being recorded. All right. Welcome to our New York Giants Preservation Society meeting for tonight, Thursday, March 16th, 2023, with uh, the great Pat Gallagher. Um, before we get started, just some uh, housekeeping to uh, tell you about. First of all, to all those celebrating, especially Pat, happy uh, St. Patrick's Day. Uh, I think it's tomorrow. Um, the walking tour, whoever uh, signed up for it, is a go. We are going to be leaving. I'll be sending out information on March 29th, um, the day before opening day. And uh, we have almost uh, two dozen people coming. So that should be a wonderful event. Uh, the next, there will be no meeting next week. So the meeting will take place on also Wednesday, the 29th with Rob Garrett. Um, and it'll be Wednesday because the following day is opening day and the Giants are playing the Yankees. And um, I think quite a few people from New York might be going to the game. So um, I don't want them to uh, miss, uh, you know, an, ex an excellent meeting. So um, the New York City Councilman reached out to me and um, they mentioned that they want to honor Billy Mays' 93rd birthday in a special way in New York City. Um, and they asked me about this tour. And I told them that there were quite a few things on the tour that need reclamation. The, uh, the home, plate, home plate plaque, you know, looks, looks like crapola. And that sign that says Willie Mays played here, keep it beautiful, that also. And then I also mentioned, you know, it's not my money, but whoever spends the money and if they want to spend it, um, there's the community center next to the uh, buildings. Uh, maybe, maybe name it Willie Mays Community Center. And his uh, house where he played stickball, the apartment, I don't know if they'd want to put up some kind of uh, plaque there saying this is where Willie Mays lived or whatever. He thought they were all really good ideas, whether any of them comes to fruition, all, one or none. An attempt was definitely uh, made to try to uh, do something, but they want to get the Giants involved with it. So we shall see what happens. Um, lastly, uh, our YouTube channel. Right now, there's like 55 subscribers. Um, if you haven't subscribed, you, you, you please do that. It's a, it was a lot of work putting it together. And, you know, I put it together not so we get a million subscribers. I put it together just so we'd have everything in our group in one place. But if you go on and watch one, just subscribe. The numbers going up just makes it look like, you know, maybe it's a viable thing or not. Um, but that I can't make you do that. You do whatever it is that pleases you. Anyway, tonight we have Pat Gallagher. Pat had spoken earlier about the uh, earlier last year um, about the Bob Lorry years with the Giants and and all the marketing uh, strategies he used to sell Candlestick Park and the like. Tonight uh, he's going to be talking about. Uh, the McGowan years, uh, you know, how they got uh, uh, Pac Bell started and keeping the Giants uh, in San Francisco and uh, everything else he did in his remarkable career, doing about everything for the Giants. So please welcome Pat Gallagher back to the New York Giants Preservation Society meeting. Pat, thank hey, you thank so you much all. for joining us. Thank you Here. all for inviting me back. I uh... Uh, I, I really enjoyed last time. I've, I've looked. I've, I've stood in on a couple of a uh, couple of the events that you've had, and uh, I, you know, I, I I think I all like I said last time. I think everybody owes uh, Gary Mintz a, a huge uh, round of applause for the work and everything that he puts into this. It's just amazing, and uh, it wouldn't be where it is. So, so what I really wanted to talk and. I, I, I um, and fortunately, I was able to send a few things. So I spent, as I said before, I spent 32 years with the Giants, um, and uh, it turned out half of my 32-year tenure was uh, under Bob Lurie's ownership, 
And then the, the last um, 16 years was under the new ownership. The, the I, I call oh, it the Peter me. McGowan, the Peter McGowan uh, ownership. And it was, you know, just to take some of you back in, in 1992, when the, um, you know, Bob had tried to, it, it tried to sell the <laughs> get investment in the team, tried to sell the team. Really, we had four elections to try to, to, to get a new ballpark built. And they all, you know, they all failed. The one in 1989 failed by, I don't know, less than a couple thousand votes, which was right after the earthquake. So Bob had, uh, and during the summer of 1992, he had gotten permission from, um, from the commissioner to, from uh, Bud Selig, who was, uh, commissioner at that time to go out and look at other you know other scenarios and then he you know as a lot of you know is he had a handshake deal to move the the team he didn't really want to do this but he had a handshake deal to move the team to Tampa St. Petersburg in uh, so in 1992 it was obviously a very uh, uh tenuous year for Giants fans you know if you work for the Giants uh you had no idea what was going to happen and you know everybody Everybody asked you questions about it. And one of the things, I didn't send this, but I actually had these buttons made. You know, I'm kind of, I'm a button guy that just said, I don't know. And we had, you know, and so I gave it to everybody who was in the organization so they could they could wear it. And so when somebody asked them a question, are the Giants going to be here next year? You can just point them to that button. And uh, it, at least we had a sense of humor about it. But in the fall of 1992, the National League, as many of you remember, the National League uh, actually voted to uh, to keep the Giants in San Francisco and accept the offer uh, from the McGowan Group, and so we went from from one owner, Bob Lurie, to I think at the time in the first group there was something like uh, eighteen to twenty investors. So it was a, sort of a much different culture, um, and a, a lot of people from the Giants from the front office. Uh, wound up staying. Some left. We brought in some new people, but it was a, it was a, a totally a new uh, sort of a new feeling. And uh, while the Giants were now saved for San Francisco, it was kind of like, okay, well, well what's going to happen now? And um, so initially, the first thing we, we wound up doing, and I I had sent some of you, you have a chance to look at them. I sent a couple videos that I that I found on on YouTube. Um, one of them was a was a, a sales video that we produced, uh, which is kind of interesting. I look, I haven't seen it for years, but it's interesting in it in that it it was in order to get people to invest in charter seats, like you know, like a lot of you have, we had to you know we went from being a tenant in a city owned ballpark to now aspiring to sort of own and operate our own ballpark. And we had to finance it differently. Um, so the the things that happened in early in 1993, the first season, uh, before that, while this while the transaction was going on, uh, Peter uh, Peter McGowan and and Larry Bear had made a, they, they wanted to have a splash, and so they went and made a deal to uh, uh, to bring Barry Bonds as a, you know as a free agent uh, to the Giants. There was one little problem though. <laughs> they didn't officially own the ball club. And so at that time when that happened, Peter, you know, Peter, you know, it, it was pretty, there was a lot of hairy moments, but that was one for him because he was actually on the hook for the $43 million uh, for seven years to pay Barry. Um, technically, he didn't, he didn't own the team or the, the group didn't own the team. So he had the comment that said, you know, Barry Bonds is either going to be with the Giants or he's going to be the most expensive bag boy at Safeway. Uh, <laughs> Peter was still chairman of Safeway. So it was kind of a hairy thing. But if you kind of look back on it, it, it you know, 43 million bucks over seven, seven years seemed like at the time, you know, a lot of people in baseball said, oh, God, the world's coming to an end. It's horrible, whatever. But I certainly could make a case that it may have been the probably the greatest free agent signing ever in terms of value because it gave us it gave us a platform now we didn't win a world championship when he was there, but it gave us a platform to try to rekindle the interest, and it certainly helped us in the new ballpark campaign. Um, I sent the sales video. If you get a chance to look at it, do it. It's it's long. It's about 13 minutes, but we actually produced that, 
And this was uh, 1990, about 1997. So there's some computer animation and stuff in there that, that you know, was sort of rudimentary then. Now it's, it's pretty easy. But what we were, we did that was we were trying to convince people that it was a new day, a new era, and that it was going to be worth investing their money and, and their interest in the Giants. So, um, but if you look at it, it was great. We had, uh, you know, you know, the, the, you know, Bobby Bonds was on it. Uh, Mike Kruko, um, the uh, uh, Matt Williams, uh, Peter, the, the great voice of Hank Greenwald, Dusty Baker. A lot of these people who were in that video uh, are, you know, sort of, there's a few of them that aren't with us any longer, but um, the whole idea was, and we actually had it, had it sent in a videotape cassette in a, in a box that was shaped like home plate. So what we were trying to do was impress people that this was this was a new era, a new age, and stuff. So that was part of the. If you get a chance to watch the uh, the sales video, do it because it's uh, uh, there's some interesting things on there, and hopefully maybe some of you have. The other thing piece that I found that I thought was really interesting was, you know, candlestick, you know, much maligned candlestick, uh, and you know all the people that. You know, we tried to make it. I tried to make it have a sense of humor about it with the little quad of candlestick and other things that we did. But candlestick, we wound up doing a wind study during the whole ballpark campaign to determine. You know, if we were going to go to all this effort to build this new ballpark, we wanted to find. We wanted to see. Um, you know, we certainly didn't want to recreate a candlestick, and the first. Um, the first iteration of the new ballpark down in China Basin was it was all it was turned around the other way. We thought it would be pretty cool for people who were sitting in the ballpark to be able to look at the city. And uh, when the wind study was done in at UC Davis um, uh, by a professor at UC Davis, they actually um, he actually said, "Well, look, if you build if you build it that way and you face it into the city, it's going to be just as uncomfortable as Candlestick Park." And that sort of stopped us in our tracks for a while because, um, you know, there was no, it, it was all lines on paper at that point, point. So they just picked the ballpark up and turned it around and faced the bay. And it's kind of like what it's like when you're walking in the wind, you know, you usually, if you're walking in, and it's winds at your back, it's generally more comfortable. Well, that's sort of what it wound up being. And he said that the, the wind actually would be more comfortable if we faced it that way. I mean, that created some other problems. One of them was we didn't have enough room to put the ballpark in. You know, right field was going to be short, but that wound up becoming a, a real asset in the ballpark. And so the, the thing that's interesting is the initial idea for the new ballpark was to have it uh, facing into the city. But the magic of turning it around so that actually a batted ball could go into go in the bay and at the time, we had the best left-handed hitter uh, in baseball. So that little piece of magic was sort of what we used to help sell the, the whole idea of, of doing it. And one of the things that, that we did, we wound up as the new ownership, we had to go, um, we had to, we decided we needed another election. And the reason why we weren't asking for money, this would, would have been the fifth, was the fifth election that we had, some in San Francisco and some down in the South Bay. But the fifth election was in, uh, wound up being in March of 1997, I, if my memory's right. And it, it, it was interesting. It, we, we were just asking for people to uh, to allow us to build this ballpark on that site. Um, we, we weren't asking for any money. We were asking for some of the some of the funds to help the infrastructure that sort of any new business would would get. And um, so we had the election and still a third of the people in San Francisco voted against it. They voted against a free ballpark. So I don't know where those people are today, but um, at the time, the reason why we did it was mostly to give the elected officials who were gonna help support us getting all the entitlements and moving everything through. We wanted to give them sort of cover so that they could sort of say, well, look, this was a vote of the people. Everybody thinks this is a good idea. And so it was as much, for that as anything else, we were privately financing a ballpark that really nobody done in modern times. And it was a scary deal. I mean, a lot of the, the finance experts, hey, our own hometown bank, Bank of America, we went and made a presentation. Uh, Peter and Larry and I went up to the 
boardroom at the Bank of America and showed them the, a picture of it and showed them what the plan was, they basically laughed at us and kicked us out and said, there's no way, it's too skinny of a deal. And at the time to build the new ballpark was uh, our budget or what we had projected after all this was $319 million. It wound up being more, it wound up being closer to 350, but $319 million and the whole the scheme was we had to raise about half of that money up front. And, um, uh, you know, usually in other areas where taxpayer support would just flow in and you'd build the ballpark. We had to, it was like, you know, building, I had to look at it. I tell people it's like building a new house. We had to come up with a down payment, which was about half the money. And so that came from several different sources. One of them was the naming rights to the ballpark. Um, and at the time we went and pitched uh, every company in the Bay Area who was anything. And uh, actually a lot of people don't know this, but Pacific Telesis, Pacific Bell Park, was actually the second choice, or, or the backup uh, for the uh, for the the ballpark naming rights. We had actually, uh, so we 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 wanted to secure more money than had ever been done, and about a third of it had to be up front that would be part of our sort of down payment. So it'd be down payment from naming rights. It would be the advance payment from uh, from secondary sponsors a concession deal that would be a, a, I think a 20 year concession deal. We'd got an upfront payment. And then this thing called a charter seat license, which, um, you know, we were doing this, it, we sort of started this in it, the, the Oakland Raiders, a lot of you remember, they had their personal seat license campaign to try to bring the Raiders back from LA, which turned out to be a total fiasco. Um, but the reality was we were really trying to do the same thing. So we had to make it smell different, look different, sound different. And uh, the Raiders sort of did us a favor by by showing us sort of what not to do. And uh, so that whole, um, the, the whole, let's say the whole scheme was, uh, it had never really been done before. And the finance experts kind of looked at it and said, you know, you had to have enough money to operate the the organization. So you had to figure out a way to leverage it in some way and stuff. So the our down payment for the ballpark was uh, $50 million from uh, Pacific Telesis. Um, the, 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 our first choice, interestingly, no, I think, and I don't know, probably none of you know this, was we went around and uh, Don Fisher uh, from The Gap was, was one of our uh, investors and they were just launching a brand new a new brand in 1997, and it was we thought it was a really cool name would have been a really cool name for the ballpark, um, and we were going to call it uh, Old Navy Field, for that brand Old Navy, which you know it, it's kind of like Wrigley Field doesn't sound like a naming rights deal or so Old Navy was our um, and we hadn't announced it yet was our uh, sort of ace in the hole, but. As it turned out, Old Navy was a, and the chairman, a guy named Mickey Drexler was the chairman at that time. And he, they'd approved the money. The, the money wasn't a problem, but he realized that, you know, they were a fashion company and fashion company is used to turning on a dime if things don't go well. And he says, you know what? I just don't know. I just don't know that we can, it's a smart thing for us to do. I don't know if this Old Navy brand is going to make it. So he sort of begged out um, of the of the whole thing, and fortunately, we had a backup, which was Pacific Telesis, and it was called Pacific Bell Park. And it's funny, you know, it, people now lament for the name of Pacific Bell Park since it's, you know, it's had it, what four names? It's you know Pacific Bell, then SBC, then for many years AT and T, and now Oracle. Um, people say, oh, they sort of lament for the old Pacific. I never figured we could make people fall in love with the name of the phone company, but. I guess in some ways, you know, that, that happened. And um, so the, um, uh, let me get, so we had to figure out a way to private, privately finance it and also control the costs on a site in the city on the waterfront. And uh, it was a challenge. Bank of America wouldn't touch it. Um, but we found um, at the time, a guy who has since passed away, who was a a key player at Chase at uh, Chase Manhattan Bank, um, 
And a young guy named Rob Tillis, who is now a, a, an expert in uh, sports venue financing, and they put together this model that relied on what they called contractually obligated income, which was we had to come up with contracts for the naming rights sp sponsor at 50 million bucks, the uh, concessionaire, a 20 year deal, the the um, um, uh, secondary sponsors. So that big Coke bottle out there, um, which uh, the initial does. <laughs> The initial design of the Coke bottle, the pitch, it was actually three times bigger than the one that wound up there, which we realized it was totally out of scale. But we, in order to get it approved by the city, we made it smaller, laid it down on its side and put that glove up in right next to it that sort of softened the whole thing. And it was very controversial. You know, to get it approved, we had to go before all kinds of city commissions. One of them, one of them that uh, had, we had the final approval, we had somebody in there, the first speaker who was pining on it said, look, I'm not, I don't, have, he said, I, I have no problem with the Coke bottle. I just don't think he should be able to serve Coke because it's bad for kids' teeth. And so it was sort of, again, stopped us in our tracks, but we, um, we prevailed, laid the Coke bottle down. And the next time, for those of you who live in San Francisco, next time, if you're walking down the Embarcadero and you see the backside of the bottle, there's no reference to Coca-Cola. And there's a string of about, I don't know, 15 palm trees that we had to plant as part of the mitigation so that we you know, sort of to shield the ballpark from people being offended by it as they were walking down the Embarcadero. Hey, San Francisco. And we did it. So, um, but the uh, the other thing that I'd sent you was Rusty, which we talked about earlier. So Old Navy, um, we, we didn't sell them the naming rights, but they wanted to become a secondary sponsor. So we sold them this thing called Old Navy Splash Landing, which was out in Wright Field. Now it's Levi's Landing, but originally it was Old Navy Splash Landing. And the, the key elements of it were the water cannons that um, that shoot water in the air uh, for home runs, you know. And and then the, the, the next piece was this mechanical robot, this 14 foot robot called Rusty, who all of a sudden would come out of his shed and Rusty could do pretty much anything. He could throw, he could pitch, he could slide, he could, you know, all those things and stuff. So that was sort of our our secret weapon. And it was part of it was part of the justification Old Navy had for spending, I can't remember how much they spent at that time. Plus they spent the money to develop um develop that. So it was a uh <laughs> it, it it was a little dicey when um all of a sudden, you know, we, we I think we brought him out, we brought Rusty out for the first exhibition game. And he came out and he did all of his, you know, hieroglyphics and all that. Stuff. He, he, he danced all around and everything. And people just started to boo it. And so we figured, I said, well, that's, you know, that's, I, you can't tell people what to do. So we started to do some other actions with it. We had to do some other stuff. And that made people boo even louder when we brought them out. So the people from Old Navy, fashion brand, they were like horrified by this. Um, and they just eventually said, we, we tried to change the face of Rusty. Some of you might remember, we actually put, um, I think we put uh, Mike Kruko's face on it, figured let's get somebody that everybody loves. They still boot it. Um, we had, uh, uh, we put another face on it um, that, um, that we thought might, might make it soften it. And nothing worked. So Old Navy just said, look, don't, we, you don't need your, we're not, we don't want our money back. We just want you to put that thing in the shed and don't let it come out and stuff. So we did that and it stayed in that shed on the uh, side of the ballpark for, I think about seven or eight years. Um, and, uh, and eventually during one of the off seasons, we actually, you know, they took the shed out. And so I, I say, if, if you're looking for Rusty now, he's, he, you know, if you're drinking a beer right now, it could be the beer can could be, you know, part of what's left of uh, Rusty. So um it was a um it was a it was sort of a mistake but i think when you make a mistake like that in the you know in the uh uh your intention is to do things that are entertaining that you know they don't all work out when people produce movies they don't all work out so um you know i probably should have gotten fired for uh for rusty but um but it now is just a cool story and it's part of the lore of the ballpark 
The other thing about the ballpark, you know, that that glove that's up there, um, the the Coke bottle was actually manufactured up in Petaluma, uh, out on the uh, shorefront in Petaluma, and it's made out of um, uh, Alaskan cedar, like you would have glue lamb for that you'd put into a, a house or something, and it was fabricated up there. And then on New Year's Day, and I can't remember, New Year's Day, I think it was 1999, they picked the bottle up with a crane and stuck it on a barge and brought it down the Napa River, down underneath the underneath the Bay Bridge and brought it over to the side. And we had the, the, the biggest marine crane that you can rent, um, picked that thing up and swung it around and the guys from Coke were there, and they were going, God, if this thing falls off the, the sling, we're all dead. But they turned it around, stuck it in that lo in that location, and then we had to we had to, had to put it on a uh, like a uh, a platform with all these wheels underneath it to be able to move it over into place. The the glove was manufactured over in Alameda in a warehouse, and it was it's got it's got an armature inside it, sort of like the Statue of Liberty has. And uh, the, the, the actual design, um, Jack Bear, who's our general counsel, who's still with the Giants, he had a, a three-fingered glove in his office that was the, uh, the, you know, was sort of the model for that. We made it into a four-fingered glove. And it, um, and it became a great feature. Originally, we put, put the little ballpark there where kids can run around. That's still there. Originally, there was a ball that was part of it. Um, you know, like a, a ball, and we thought it would be cool to allow the fans to autograph the ball. Well, like I'll, any of you have ever been in, in projects or can, renovations or whatever, you, you know what the term value engineering is. Well, um, value engineering uh, sort of, we had to X something out of that. So the ball wound up going for us to bring it in sort of on time and on budget. And uh, but it's a, it turned out to be a, a, a great feature. Um, a lot of the, you know, there, there, there were pundits in San Francisco who said, God, how could they put that ugly Coke bottle in the middle of it? And there were people that, but you know what? And we had a tough time getting it approved. But what I predict this is that now what has ballpark been around for what, 20, 23 years? Um, and they've renewed the Coke deal a couple of times. And I've been gone for, you know, for, uh, I left the Giants about 14 years ago. And uh, I predict that if they ever decide to uh, not uh, renew the deal and they take the Coke bottle out, there'll be a whole group of preservationists that will, that will, that will pick it in order to save the Coke bottle, which is sort of how things happen here. But it's become you know, part of the whole, the whole thing. The deal with the, with the ball splashing in the bay, and you, you can see it on that little video that we use to help sell it, just that little bit of magic, a batted ball splashing in the water is sort of what we use to help uh, bring the ballpark uh, to make it real. We created a, a tabletop, uh, about the size of a pool table model of the ballpark that during the election that we had, we, we took it and we plopped it down in almost every neighborhood in San Francisco and invited people to come and take a look at it. Because we were trying to convince people that this was a a real thing and that we were actually going to do it. Um, but, um, and, and I don't know where that scale model is, or that model, it's not scale, it's it's uh, about the size of a pool table. It's some, probably in some bar somewhere, I don't know. But uh, anyway, so it was a, um, it was an interesting, that whole thing was interesting. But the thing that's interesting, the most interesting thing about the way the ballpark was financed, about the privately financed thing, was uh, our investors, our owners, um, sort of were hoping or sort of relying on the fact that we would figure out a way to get taxpayer support to help fund the ballpark. And when it was determined, we did a bunch of surveys and we it was it determined that there was no appetite for any kind of taxpayer support. That was a that was a, a somber a somber message. And in presenting it to our investors. The the reality was, and the way that it was sold was, uh, a lot of them were pissed because they figured that was going to be that was the way all the ballparks were built. You could get some, maybe a small amount, but some taxpayer support. We couldn't get it, and so 
we did an analysis of um, of staying at Candlestick, where the Giants were hemorrhaging money. Um, except, you know, during the during the good years, we would do it. But it, but our attendance was like an EKG. I mean, if we had a good year, we'd do well. Otherwise, people would find other things to do. Um, but the analysis said that even taking on all this debt, which which the, our our owners had to, they had to sign a thing called a letter of credit because we had like 20, 20 owners at the time. I don't remember the, the exact number. And they sort of had to put their, 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 you know, their worth against this whole thing, which is gave uh, the sponsors confidence that this thing was actually going to happen. And it gave, um, it, it sort of made it, made it real that it would actually happen. But, but the chances of making money or, or breaking even at the time, what, what the what our survey said, what our uh, our study said was, and this is what we presented to the owners was that <laughs> was they said, look, you can stay at Candlestick, and you're going to be faced with moving again because this thing is you know you're going to you're going to hemorrhage thirty, forty, fifty million dollars a year depending on, and this was before you know salaries started to head where they're going, or you could build this ballpark, and you would have a chance of breaking even if you build the ballpark. I mean, that was not, that was a tough pill for a lot of the owners uh, and investors to swallow. Now, nobody had predict, nobody knew, nobody could have predicted at that time what would have happened, what happened to the whole franchise value. If I take you back all the way, Bob Lurie bought the Giants in 1976 for 8 million bucks. That was for the whole, the whole thing. He had his partner, Bud Herseth, um, who we bought out um, a year into it. He wound up selling the Giants in uh, to the McGowan Group in uh, 1990, uh, 1990, uh, 1992 for about $100 million. But he had, Bob had absorbed losses getting up to that. So, you know, it, it wasn't the, the, the panacea that everybody thought. And all of a sudden, these investors who had all plunked down as a group, a lot of them plunked down like $5 million bucks. That was a whole, that was sort of the ante. Um, none of them had the appetite for cash calls, which is what was going to happen. So some of the original investors, you know, the, the Charles Schwab and Don Fisher and Charles Short uh, and, and uh, uh, Walter Shorenstein and um, some of those, a lot of those guys after the, you know, the first year, 1993 was great. That's the year that we, you know, we came one game short of m moving into the, Moving into the into the playoffs, um, and, but it was a uh, and then after that, nineteen ninety four. A lot of you remember that was the year of the strike. So all of a sudden, we were sort of dead in the water um, about that, and it was a it was a uh, things were not happy among the ownership group with the Giants, and some of those original guys got out which allowed guys who or allowed people who were in it like Charles Johnson and Harmon Burns and others to actually up their ante to buy some of the positions that some of the other um, some of the owners had. And that's how, sort of how they got to the positions that they had was. Uh, but the thing that nobody knew about, nobody counted on was what was going to happen to franchise value, franchise value. You know, at the time, we thought we were going to have a break even proposition. And um, it, the, the thing that I, I, I say probably is most when a lot of you know who Steve Ballmer is, who was the guy who bought the L.A. Clippers, who sort of was the first guy to bid two. He built he, he bid two billion dollars to buy the L.A. Clippers. The net effect of that was that it took every sports franchise's net value and raised it without doing anything just raised it. And people say, well, how could it be possibly worth that amount? And when people say that, and I tell them, I said, well, look, I, it probably, it may not pencil out, but um, it's like buying, it's like buying art. I mean, if you wanted to buy the Mona Lisa, what would you have to pay for it? Or what would you have to pay for something like that? So it's, it, look, it, it, this, the economics have totally, have totally gone crazy. But, um, you know, the money's got to, it's got to be there. Now, I always used to say, God, you know, the world was coming to an end when we had the first million dollar player. 
And uh, then it was maybe the first $10 million player. I'm not sure where it's all, where it's all headed, but it is a, um, uh, I'm sort of glad, I'm sort of glad in a way. I mean, I love, I'm a baseball fan now and I love going to the games. I still have season tickets. I have my charter seats, which I, which I pay for. Uh, Russ, I saw Russ Stanley who joined the, who joined the uh, thing and uh, Russ, I'm, I'm, I, I renewed this year. I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm not sure about next year, but I'm, we but I'm in. It. Thank you. Thank but you. it is a, um, uh, a lot of the things that happened in the development during my second um, 16 years um, were, uh, there was a scary time and it was, you know, we were doing something that nobody had ever done privately financed the ballpark and um, to bring it, to bring it in on budget and on time was a Herculean effort. And it was, it was scary. There were some things about it that were scary. Um, I had the opportunity at the time, this is, I'll mention this and then I'll open it up for questions, is that we went from being a tenant in a city owned ballpark where we paid rent and all that to all of a sudden now owning and operating our, our own ballpark, which is a, you know, much different proposition. So at that time, I had the opportunity um, to start this thing called, we, at the time, it was a question mark. It was called Giants Enterprises. And it was really nothing, but it was kind of like, okay, we've got this ballpark. We play baseball, you know, you know 80 some dates a year. Um, what are we going to do with it for the rest of the time? So Giants Enterprises just was, okay, what do we do? How do we do it and not screw things up for baseball if we can do other things in there? So, I mean, we 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 came close to screwing it up a few times, but we had um, we played football there. We we actually uh, started a bowl game. Um, we we moved the old East West Shrine game over there for a few days, and and like a lot of the old ballparks, you know, like the Polo Grounds and Wrigley Field, a football gridiron would just fit in there just barely. Um, it wasn't ideal, but it it worked. We actually, actually, University of California played a season. It was one season over there. They played their games. Um, we had motocross. We had we tore. We had motorcycles racing across the thing uh, every year for a number of years. We did. Uh, we had the ski jumping championships there. Uh, ski snow snowboarding and ski jumping, which was a totally ridiculous thing to do. But but my job at that time was to try to figure out how to bring in additional revenue. We had some mega concerts. We had, you know, the Rolling Stones, we had Bruce Springsteen, we had Dave Matthews Band, we had them all. And it became sort of a cool place to play because it was right on the water in San Francisco. Um, we did get a few noise complaints, um, <laughs> which is a whole other story, but I'm sort of gonna stop here. We can pick it up, but I, I just wanna, you know, I wanted to give you a flavor. So sort of what my, my second 16 years with the Giants, and I, you know, we could be here for hours and I could try to go through it, but I, I, I wanted to give you a flavor for some of the things that um, that were out there and give you some things to look at. So I'll entertain any questions and we can decide where to take this. Todd, I got to tell you, that was so entertaining and it was wonderful that you said initially way back when to split this into two. So thank you. I, I'm going to start with a, a couple of things. Number one, you know, you worked your behind off to sell candlestick. So the Giants opened up 2002 at uh, Pac Bell. 2000. Yeah, 2000. I'm sorry, 2000. And you're, uh, you're standing there on opening day. What are you thinking when you're seeing the place totally new, totally full? You know what? I was, I'll tell you what I was thinking, and Russ Stanley could attest to this. So, we, we, we race to get the ballpark finished. I mean, no matter how much time you have, it's like a deadline. It's not like a shopping center where you can say opening in spring of 2000. I mean, we had a, we had a schedule, we had a day, we had all those things. And I remember the first event we had there, which was an exhibition game. Um, and it was, uh, it was so excruciating to get the place open and to staff it and all the other stuff after the game was over people were just exhausted. You kind of go, God, we got to do this again. Um, and the opening day's coming. I mean, it was a, it was a one, an incredible feeling. I mean, I, Hey, listen, I, I cried. Uh, um, we also, we had no idea at that point 
Old Navy, initially Old Navy was as part of their deal, they were going to donate $5,000 for every home run in the Bay, you know, every splash hit. Um, and then some, some nerd at Old Navy sort of did the calculation and figured out, Jesus, you know, there, there'll be hundreds of these things. So the marketing guy said, well, wait a minute, we can't do $5,000. Let's tone it down to do $500. And it's interesting. Now we got 23 years. And what, what do we have? Like about a little over 100 splash hits that have been done. So nobody really knew. Who was the player? With, was it Kevin Elster who hit three home runs in one of the first games? And I said, oh, my God, this thing is a bandbox. It's going to be terrible. But <laughs> um, But it wasn't. It sort of worked out. A lot of things... A lot of things, and, and I got to give Peter McGowan, who sadly is no longer with us, he he was the most in, intuitive um, marketing guy I ever met and was courageous because he had to keep this group of investors together and he had to go through all the other stuff that that, you know, to make it all happen and to justify bringing buried bonds in and dealing with bonds and the whole thing. I mean, it was uh, and, I, you know, it, it's. It's sad because he got to see, he got to see a world championship. He wasn't running the organization by then, but uh, I think you know Peter McGowan and you got to give Larry Bear a lot of credit for pulling it together. And guys like Russ Stanley, who's here watching us, um, were um, were all part of that group. That um, that it, it's hard to tell the story without choking up because it was so it was so scary. So. Anyway, I being there, I, I was totally thrilled. I thought it was great, but I'm going, oh my God, we got to do this again. So and my, my other thing is turning to today. Um, as a season ticket holder, other than of course, hopefully the team improving, do you see anything uh, with the stadium that initially how you started was looking great and now you feel needs improvement? You know, I, I think one of the cool things that the Giants have done um, since is that they've always done things to refresh the ballpark and to tweak it a little bit. I mean, you know, the dimensions have changed a little bit, but not not it was very thoughtful the way they did it. Moving the bullpens, you know, Peter's one of Peter's deal was wanting to have the bullpens on the field because he loved Wrigley Field and thought that was something for the fans. The other piece of it, practical piece was we were selling charter seats you know, once you get outside the bases, we wanted to have something for the fans who were buying charter seats. So having those bullpens might, might have been dangerous for a player, but, you know, we, hey, we, we, so so we moved those out and moved to the outfield, which was the right thing to do. You know, we took the names off the back of the jerseys and now they're back on the, you know, so there's been things that have changed over the years, but I think the Giants deserve a lot of credit for keeping the ballpark as, as really as fresh as possible. And now, you know, you've got those skyscrapers across the channel that, you know, is part of that development. Um, but it's a different business. It's a different business now than it was when we got into it. And I think those are going to be the things, the financial wherewithal to be able to compete going forward. I mean, we can talk, you know, the, the, the Giants whiffed on a couple of the big free agents, uh, uh, you know, that, that that's disappointing. But if you look at it from a practical standpoint, the one thing that that does is, it gives you a lot of a lot of hope during your prime selling time, which is, you know, from the fall all the way to start, whereas the Giants could be good or they could be lousy this year. Nobody's going to know until until you actually take the field. Nobody really knows. So um, it's it makes it harder to generate the interest that you have to generate to make the thing happen. And I, you know, I'm looking at Russ Stanley here and I'm going, you know, he, every year. And we used to do the ceremonial reading of the numbers every week at our staff meetings. And, you know, it's, yeah, and they're still doing that, you know, stuff. So anyway. Thank you. Mars, you're up, Mars. Oh, that was very informative. Thank you for joining us. So I, I go back uh, to the 1997 when they put the personal, uh, the charter seat license for sale. I remember having to go to the Embarcadero to, to buy yeah. it. And my uh, my name and my partner, my deceased partner's name are in the bricks and in, in, uh, the Willie Mays Plaza there. So uh, those were the 13,000 plus charter seat license holder. And of course, we know about the 50 million the phone company put in for the naming rights. Right. Uh, as far as the Coke bottle goes, 
that will if they ever take that away that'll become infamous like the doggy diner the hound you remember that oh yeah <laughs> you know and uh then I, I wanted to ask a question about uh candlestick in the wind i think it was the video that gary sent uh they talk it spoke about if the candlestick was moved to the north it could have avoided all that wind but with all the engineers in the bay area it, it's kind of amazing nobody figured that out you know well uh, that was 19 remember that was 1960 when they opened that and it was sort of the you know at the time the giants probably would have stayed at, stayed at seal stadium if they and they could have put a second deck on seal stadium but the thing that wasn't going to happen was that Horace Stoneham initially was promised 15,000 parking spaces. Right. And so the, the, the state of the art in those years was to put a, make a ballpark in the middle, you know, like a spaceship in the middle of a gigantic parking lot. Well, that couldn't happen in Seal Stadium. So that only the only other plot of land that was available was that, you know, windswept thing out at Candlestick. What was really interesting about it is, you're right, that if they'd moved the ballpark around, it would have less of an effect. But if but we learned during the earthquake in 1989, if the ballpark had been moved further out, which would have made it maybe more comfortable, the whole thing might have collapsed during the earthquake because it was on bedrock, which was and if you read back through a lot of the initial uh, construction stuff, the, whoever was in charge at that time insisted that the ballpark had to be on bedrock. And so they may have been able to tweak it and move it around the other side of the mountain and maybe it would have been better. Also, when the ballpark was built, if you remember, those of you who remember, it was open open to the bay. You could see the bay, and it was 1971 when the when the um, when the city enclosed it to to make you know to move the the 49ers there, and they figured, hey, we're going to enclose this. It's going to make the wind better, whatever. What it did is it made the wind actually worse. It whipped around in circles, and stuff. So it took a it took sort of a, a mediocre ballpark and made it into a in probably the worst multi-purpose stadium ever built, which, you know, that wasn't the intention. You just didn't know at that time uh, what was going to happen. So that's why those wind studies that were done were were really so important. Um, and thank God we listened. And can you imagine if, if the ballpark had been facing into the city? It would have been as cold as Candlestick. Well, Pat, are you familiar why Paris Sodom couldn't get the 15,000 parking spaces? Uh, yeah, Seal because at, at Seal Stadium, at Seal Stadium, there was, you know, it was sort of, you know, sort of landlocked. And around it, there was a muni yard that's still there that was like across the street. And they figured they could do the parking and stuff there. Well, that wasn't going to happen. What It was not going to happen. So it, it was sort of a bitter pill. But the city had promised him, and he was, I guess it was patient. I mean, there was a lot of things he wasn't. But he was patient about this. And... Um, the, the, the new state-of-the-art stadium, Candlestick Park, was going to be built out in the landfill. And at the time, people thought when it was built, people thought it was going to be, you know, it was the state-of-the-art. It was, it was going to be terrific. A lot of the things that you take into consideration now, people just didn't know about. And, you know, I think Candlestick, when it was originally built, I think the soup to nuts, the whole thing was about 12 million bucks, I think, to build it. Well, here's the real reason why Stoneham couldn't get his parking spaces across the street on 16th Street. Yeah. That was designated for a city park by the founders. And in the will, uh, uh, it said that it's if it's going to be used for anything other than a, a, a park devoted to the city, it's going to revert back to the heirs. That put the kibosh on all those parking spaces you know that Stoneham wanted. You're right. You're right. You know, you're right. And it's and you know, the last it's, question I have yeah. is did the Giants pay off the mortgage in half the time instead of 40 years, 20 years? No, actually, interesting is part of the financing. I'm not a finance guy, but I, I know just enough to be dangerous is that it was uh, the big piece of the, of the loan was 20 years. They called it non recourse debt, and it was at 8%. And the consortium of lenders who Chase assembled were things like CalPERS, you know, the pension. And, you know, for, for the people who run those, to have a, a guaranteed 8% every year for 20 years, that was pretty attractive. So the Giants had the wherewithal to, to pay that off, but, um, but it wasn't, 
they, they had to honor those commitments, but it did allow the, 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 the additional revenue that we had in those last years, it allowed, I wish John Yee, who was our chief financial officer was here, he could have explained it better than I can, is that they, in essence, kind of parked the money and were able to pay it off sooner, but they, they had to honor that obligation to the original, um, uh, the original lenders. And, uh, you know, at the end too, you remember, it was not just pay it off the ballpark, but the whole Pacific Bell deal uh, ended after, you know, at, at that same time, all of a sudden that ended. And so now the Giants have the ability to, to bring in a new naming rights partner, which is really difficult. But at the time, um, the, you know, the fact that some timing's everything, you know, Oracle, you know, had the Oracle arena in, um, in Oakland and they, they sort of got shut out of that when the Warriors moved into the Bay Area. So for Oracle to be able to, to sort of plant the flag on this, you know, beautiful ballpark, you know, it was, it was smart, but it's also incredible, incredibly fortunate on the timing. Thank well, you. we're all pushing Steve, for William ahead, A's Steve. field at Oracle Park. Thank you, Pat. That was very informative. Steve, go ahead. Thanks so much for coming back. And as uh, Mars just said, very informative. A couple of comments and then one quick question. Uh, at the time um, the ballpark was built, I was still living in New York. Now I'm in Arizona. I've probably been to close to 100 games, but I was fortunate to be at the opener, April 11, 2000. A cousin of mine uh, had part, has part ownership in his suite. And I had two tickets and took my buddy, Alan Abrams, who we were speaking about before you came on. We went out to the ballpark and my cousin gave us each a brick, like Mar said, that's in front of Willie Mays Plaza. The nicest thing before the opening game was the walk in the park where you guys opened up the ballpark to basically everybody. I think it was Saturday. Yeah. We had never seen anything like that. I mean, growing up in, in New York City, I mean, <laughs> George Steinbrenner would never open up Yankee Stadium to walk around and check it all out. So we kind of knew what we were in for on the opening day. So we get into the ballpark opening day. We're in a suite. I had never seen something that beautiful. And I walked out of the suite. I start walking towards third base and bingo, there's Willie Mays in his suite. Yeah. So I ran, got my buddy Allen, and we went into the suite. Where are you guys from? The Bronx. What are you doing here from the Bronx? He signed an autograph. I walk a few more doors down. There's McCovey. We get his autograph. And as we're leaving, there's Cepeda. I just ran out of energy. I said, Alan, I can't run anymore. It's done. Well, we got these two autographs. When the ballpark was done, it was done. All it was left is to create memories, which you just came on, rattled off a couple of them. Oh, and that's my what's God. Been one so great. question I have for you, which has yeah. nothing to do with your talk. Uh, Gary and I befriended a young lady in Cooperstown. I think it was 2003. Allison Vidal. Yeah, I think she was the promotions gal. She yeah. brought in the sleep, the, the sleep yeah. night at, at the ballpark. I know she ended up leaving for Stanford, I think. She ended up with a family. Yeah. I remember meeting her aunt because I was able to see the Giants and Marlins in 03 in the playoffs. Yeah. The, uh, Allison. Let me tell you about Allison. Allison yes, was, a, was a, uh, an outstanding um, amateur tennis player. Actually, he's in the San Francisco yes. Prep Hall of Fame I remember as that. a tennis yeah. player. And she did go to Stanford, but now she's involved. She's in, she's got a family. And she's involved with uh, tennis. Uh, I think it's a tennis foundation, I believe. Uh, you know, Russ may know, but I, I think that she's doing that. Great gal, and um, you know, she moved on, and uh, uh, but uh, has done really great stuff. The other, the last thing. Every time I go to the ballpark, and it's been twenty years since I'm living in Arizona, so I, I like I said, it must have been close to hundred games. A lot of the same employees are still working there. Yeah. Be it the usher, be it the elevator operators, and they're always happy people. It's well, great. you know, it, 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 it's when you get to moonlight, and a lot of these people are either retired, or a lot of a lot of teachers or people who have seasonal, you know, who have summers off, whatever, or nights and weekends off, and it this becomes yes, it's a job, but it's more of a it's it, it's sort of their social their social life. And God, the, the ballpark would never be able to have the character and the personality without the people who work there. It was one of the one of the things that was frustrating at Candlestick because the if our attendance was like an EKG, you couldn't afford to keep a workforce busy because you know you'd have ten thousand people one day and forty thousand people another day. So 
I think one of the big assets of the ballpark are the people who work there. Thank you very much. Bill Clank, you're up, Bill. Thank you, Gary, and thank you, Pat. I'll tell you, first off, I, many of us are devotees of Bill Vick. He, he you take no uh, sidestep to to Bill. I mean, wow, you did. That's a I huge think, compliment. Thank I, you. I tell you, Bill, he did he did extraordinary things. You did outrageous things. <laughs> <clears throat> but I want to comment on the football element for a moment. I saw the the very first Walnut Bowl in two thousand and two. Mm -hmm. uh, there at the park and uh, it was my only my second trip to the park but one of the things that they have you may remember uh, that's very unusual for that kind of a ballpark they had to have the uh both teams had to be on the same side of the field yeah a substitution in a baseball park and we have it down here at chase or bank one or whatever we call it now it's an enormous problem getting the players in and out when they're not on the same, right. on different sides. And I, I guess you can never get around well, that. No, but I, I'll, I'll give you the reason for it was just because of that, because of the shallowness of the of the stands is that big football players, you couldn't put the bench on that side because people in those lower rows couldn't see them. See. So that's why you, there was all a bunch of compromises. The one that I almost did and didn't do it was the end line, you know, 100 yards plus the end zones, the end line, over uh, in in left field was like two feet from the wall yeah. so we had to put a big pad on the wall and for a while we actually toyed with because the first games we did there were you know the east west shrine game and we had our own bowl game which were you know not official i actually toyed with you know, making them 11 inch yards i mean 11 11 inch feet so to take an inch off of her. and so <laughs> if we did that we actually would have picked up about six feet out there <laughs> but, and i figured well hell nobody's ever going to go you're measure. Gonna notice. but then you kind of go well you have to you'd have to you have to figure out you have to shorten the chains, chains you have have to do to all that it. stuff so yeah. and eventually we'd get discovered probably yeah. um but um but that was a that was on the table for a while i actually had hok our architect i said look make them make them an in, the yards an inch shorter and see how it works and they said yeah it fits really great i wanted to ask you about an owner we're going to get rid of that. Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to ask you about an owner. And and it's not, you know, those 18, I imagine, as guys with blue, blue suits on, red ties, and white shirts, that kind of people. But there was one owner, and I'm, I'm just now starting to learn more about him, uh, thanks to Rob Garrett's book, as a matter of fact. Not to plug uh, Rob, but uh, the book talked about a guy I never knew much about, Bud Hersick. Well, yeah, I'll tell. I'll do a quickie. Bud Hersa he, was the guy. Me, this guy is absolutely crazy. Well, he was crazy, but he was a he was in a cattle business in Arizona, and the Giants were literally a few hours away from mo moving to Toronto. And you know, Bob Lurie, God bless Bob Lurie. You know, the purchase price of the team was eight million bucks. He said, "I'll put up four million, but I got to have a partner." And so this guy, Bud Hersa, was watching this thing on television in Arizona. And he said, hell, I, yeah, you know, so he called the mayor's office in San Francisco and said, I'll play, I'll, I'll put up the other 4 million bucks. So they, um, if Corey Bush, who was in the mayor's office at that time, I know has spoken for this group, he, you know, they verified who this guy was. And so by him doing that last minute call, it, it, it made it all work. Now the guy was a total nut and Bob wound up buying him out the next year. Uh, so he, he invested four million bucks and Bob bought him out for, I think, a half million dollar premium or something. So, you know, he got a chance to, you know, to, to, to be a baseball owner for a year. But he but was on him. The Giants would have. not. That's been right. So the big question, I wish Bob Lurie was here. I asked him years later. I said, look, you know, Bob's an incredibly wealthy man. I said, Bob, if he if you hadn't found her, Seth, would you have come up with the other four million bucks? And he kind of smiled and he wouldn't give me a straight answer. And then he finally said, yeah, I probably would have. So <laughs> who knows? He didn't have to, but. Very good. Herseth, uh, apparently, uh, but uh, Bob asked him what he did for fun. You know, I think. Uh, he was a gambler. Not just a gambler, 
He yeah. would go out in the desert between Casa Grande and Maricopa, Arizona. He would get his rifle out and shoot rattlesnakes. And Bob just about blanched at that idea. They couldn't be more different. Oh, yeah. Um, so it wasn't going to work. Yeah. And uh, anyway, it's just part of the lore of the Giants. But he actually owned the team for a year and uh, uh, kept the Giants from moving to Toronto. Oh, thank God. Thank you, Bill. Audrey, thank you're you. up. Audrey. Unmute. Hi, Audrey. You're on. You're muted, Audrey. Can't hear you. Sorry, you I apologize. Right. I was muted and couldn't. I. You can ask Gary. It's hard to mute me, so you guys should just appreciate it. My <laughs> husband does. Um, two things. Um, we were at the exhibition game with the Yankees in 2000, and I have to tell you, we had been to um, the ballpark in Arlington. Uh, the year before with KNBR, and we kept saying, God, if our ballpark is half as nice as this, we're going to be so happy. And it's like, it's a thousand times better than Arlington. It was so wonderful. We just couldn't believe it. We were just blown away. But the question I wanted to ask you, and it's kind of an odd one, I think I know the answer, but I want to see what you have to say. Not counting the parking or transportation, what was the number one complaint right after the ballpark opened from the fans? Well, there was a, the, the, a bunch, bunch of little, first of all, people were blown away. I mean, you think you go from the worst ballpark in the major leagues to what a lot of people, including me, think is the best ballpark because of the location and everything else. But, you know, a lot of people complained about um, there were some obstructed seats in the ballpark that had, it was mentioned earlier, where you had a, you had a railing that was obstructing views. Eventually, and it took it took a couple of years, eventually a lot of that stuff was fixed by using plexiglass and all that. Yeah. But I think the, um, the, the biggest complaint probably was just a whole new way of doing it. I mean, the, Candlestick was a place that the only way you could get there was by car. And if you took your life in your hands by getting on Muni to go out there. Yeah. So a lot of people didn't do that. But this Paul Park was... We actually put, we actually arranged for more parking than we needed because people wouldn't believe, you know, they, they were freaking out saying we were, you don't have enough parking. Well, I don't think, I think we may have filled up the parking lot that we leased around maybe one or two times, but this whole dispersed parking thing actually worked. People were perfectly willing to park five or six blocks away and walk or take, ride a bike or do whatever. And um, it's now why there's not a whole ton of parking, sort of like the way Wrigley Field and some of the other urban ballparks worked, is that the whole urban ballpark that you have other ways to get there actually works. But initially, people didn't believe it, and they were freaked out. That may have been one of the biggest complaints. Now you have the Chinatown subway line going there, too. Well, yeah, I'm actually, I'm going to take it. I haven't been on it yet, but I'm going to, I live over in Cow Hollow, um, and I, it's going to be shorter. I'm going to take that when I go to the first game and see how it is. That sounds good. Well, I will tell you what, what I thought the number one complaint would be, and it wouldn't be coming from me, but from the scuttlebutt was that there were no troughs in the men's bathroom anymore. Like there had been. Well, yeah, a lot of people <laughs> like <them. laughs> Well, also, also a lot of people didn't admit this, but actually in the final uh, construction stuff, there were fewer, the plants, there were fewer urinals in the men's room then we're actually on the plan. And, and the Kajima, the, our construction uh, company, actually had to go back in and put in more urinals uh, that were that were on the design, that were probably paid for. Um, but that was another one. And just because everything is so, and if you walk around the ballpark now, it would have been nicer to have wider concourses and stuff. Yeah. But there just wasn't, we just didn't have the room. Yeah, well, I will tell you that from the ladies' point of view, Seeing yeah. them don't have to line up isn't it wasn't a bad thing because we always do. So <laughs> it was it was okay. We didn't care that the men were lining up. Hey, next time you go, I'll tell you one other thing is you know the whole thing I mentioned about value engineering, where you have to, you know, you have to cut the price and stuff. One of the things next time you're in the bathroom on any of the like main level, look up because one of the things that was value engineered out was the roof. Yeah, on there's the, no on the room, the restrooms. Yeah, it's all it's all pipes. 
He yeah, well, that was originally had a roof, but we, we, we had to cut that to to meet the budget. We also, I think, cut one or two escalators out, which I think the Giants are eventually going to put back. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like if, if you didn't know it was supposed to be there, you won't miss it. So exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Pat, you got time for like five more? Yeah, no, I'm I'm, I'm here. This is fun. all right. We're going to go to Dan then Dave then Paul, then Norm. Dan, the man with the golden voice. <laughs> Pat, thanks for doing this. I could listen to you all day long, and your two talks have been wonderful. Thank you. Uh, real quick question. How did other owners react to a privately financed ballpark? They were pissed. They were, I mean, <laughs> no, they really were. They were pissed. They go, we can't let them get away with that, blah, blah, blah. So Peter, Peter was not a popular guy among the brethren of the owners because if somebody could figure out a way to privately finance it, if you're a taxpayer in one of these other cities that you know all of a sudden you're having to you're going to vote on this thing, why the hell would you do that? So no, it was not well received by the other owners, and uh, you know we we always sort of took it as a matter of pride. We said, well, look, it would have been a hell of a lot easier to do this with taxpayers' money. We just couldn't get it, and that this was the only way that it could happen. So we wound up doing a skinny deal um, to build a ballpark, which um, you know. In other cities, you know, you, you you all of a sudden you turn on the spigot and you got taxpayer support. So, not happy. They were not happy about it. Was there, if you can share, was there any one in particular that was louder than the others, or any one that tried to scuttle anything? No, I don't think they tried to scuttle it. But they, you know, the usual suspects. I mean, the the, the people. Not now, Dodger Stadium when it was built, you know, back in I think sixty two. That was actually um, yes. in a sense privately financed. So. Yeah. So, but it wasn't, it was from these other guys that were trying to get taxpayers. I mean, the guys in Cincinnati were not happy about it. <laughs> the other, I mean, I can't exactly remember which ones uh, were the, were the, the ones that were not happy about it. I wish Peter was here. He could tell you. I don't. It I don't wasn't know. originally uh, uh, owner finance. It was LA that owned it, the stadium and the land. Yeah. But Walter O'Malley bought both years later. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that, Pat. I appreciate it. Dave, you're up. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Pat, I want to say that was an unbelievably informative and fascinating uh, talk. Uh, the second is that me and my uh, great uncle Izier are responsible for there being uh, pool tables in the Gotham Club. Although why you're honoring Izzy is a good question because he helped rig the 1919 World Series. And the third thing is in 1993, I flew all the way from my Navy duty station in Japan to be interviewed for a job in your uh, public relations office. I thought I gave a good interview because I was ex I was close to being out of the Navy, and I was hoping that you'd, the team would hire me so I could become a lifer dog. But then I got a polite note saying, well, it's all very nice interviewing you, but forget it. So my question to you is, what did I do wrong? Hey, you're probably way better off. You know, you probably you're going to work ridiculous hours for lo for low pay, and well, that's uh, just like the Navy. <laughs> I have no idea what you did wrong. I mean, look, people, a lot of people want to work there, and I always tell people, look, this is not we're not curing a disease here. We're not. This is not. We're not shooting rockets to the moon. I mean, we're we're running a baseball team, and right. uh, we're in the I'm entertainment sure. business. I'm, I I was a Pulitzer nominated award-winning journalist who, with experience in public affairs, broadcast, print. And Maybe they were uh, afraid that you were too qualified. I don't know. Third, and a third-generation Giants fan. I mean, what was there not? What, what was I missing? I, I you don't know what? get it. What? Hey, you, you know what? If, if it would have been my decision, I would have hired you. How's that? Thank you. Okay, but I, 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 I would someday I hope I can find out because it, it uh, you know, it really hurt at the time. If for what it's worth, I stayed in the Navy and they sent me to, to New Zealand. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Paul, you're up. Yeah, Pat, um, in, your, in your working with the Giants, is there one special thing that you're most proud of in your work that you did, that you were able to accomplish? You know, I, I, looking back on it, and you know, I got a chance to now reflect on it, um, you know, I got a chance to do some pretty ridiculous things. But um, I was, I'm proud of ne never getting fired because um, there was probably some things that maybe I should have. But, I, but all the things I did were the intentions were right. And, um, and God bless Bob Lurie. 
he, you know what, he went along with some stuff that, um, you know, I, I couldn't imagine another owner, I couldn't imagine somebody like George Steinbrenner going along where you're basically daring people to show up at your ballpark, never would have happened. And then I was fortunate enough to work for a guy like Peter McGowan, who was, I said, he was, he was, he was the best, sort of the best and most courageous marketing guy that I'd ever met. And now I got a chance to work for him. So he allowed us to do stuff that was that was wild. I mean, the thing that happened, and Russ Stanley could tell you this now, we actually, in selling these charter seats, we were actually selling people way more tickets than they wanted to buy. So we had to come up with this, this secondary market thing that, um, so Russ and I actually, the, in coming up with the old double play ticket window, which was the first of the secondary market, I actually spent some time with the original guys who did StubHub and they came in and picked my brain and Russ's brain and they started StubHub. And I had, you know, I said it's loyalty over brains. I, if, if, I, if I'd been smart, I would have jumped in and been one of the founders of, of the secondary um, ticket market. But, you know, stuff like this happens. I mean, I, I, you know, what can you do about it? Well, thank you very much for sharing your story, Pat. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. The great Norm Coleman, you're up, Norm. Hey, Norm. Hi, Pat. Thank you so much for your presentation. You are a wealth of information, and um, it's very much appreciated. I've got a question that I've always been wondering about. Um, you open a new ballpark, and you guys really step it up on your promotional giveaway items. And I always wondered how you get the sponsors and how you determine how many items you're giving away. Well, it's a it's a great question. I mean, you you the first thing is you don't ever want to have you don't want to have people who are disappointed. I mean, the 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 items that you give away are um, are uh, you know you, you sort of factor in if it's only kids. You you want to make sure that every kid. I mean, the last thing you want is somebody disappointed. And, and I can't say that we haven't disappointed people from time to time, but um, but also the sponsors with the new ballpark. You know, it was much easier to sell sponsors to do things at the new ballpark than it was at Candlestick. And it, so it was, I'll tell you just one little story that's really kind of funny is we used to give away baseball gloves, you know, regular baseball gloves. You know, look, they're made in Taiwan and they're made out of plastic, but, you know, it looks like, you know, it looks like Naga hide, whatever, but people loved them. And there, you, you know, you could use them to autograph and stuff. And so, but the big dilemma was how many right-handed gloves versus how many left-handed gloves would you do? And so the guy who I used, who I bought the the uh, the gloves from, who imported them from Taiwan or somewhere over there, he said, "Well, um, you, you, seven seven percent. You should get roughly seven or eight percent of the gloves ought to be left-handed gloves." And I didn't believe him. I said, "Yeah, that's crazy. That can't be right." And so for the first couple of years, we give away gloves. We always wound up having a bunch of uh, left-handed gloves left over. And by God, he was right. And so the population, about left, about 7% of the population is left-handed. And I learned that by the amount of gloves that we would have to give away on uh, on glove day. So, um, you know what? I think a lot of creative stuff was great. I mean, a lot of the things that are given away are, you're, you know, you, you want to have a value add. I mean, the whole idea was to have a great attraction, have somebody go home with something in their hand, and maybe you've created a baseball fan. That's that was the whole that was the whole reason to get into it. So so the Giants would figure out then we'll give out twenty thousand bobbleheads today as opposed to sponsors deciding that. Sometimes sometimes it would be how much could you how much money could you get a sponsor to pay? Um, you know um, I I don't know I, I, if Mario was here we could we could blast him with all these questions because I I always accuse him of uh, you know of being cheap but. Um, but it, it, I think it's the goal is to not is to segment it in such a way that you don't have people disappointed. That that that's the real idea, and particularly kids being disappointed. Um, you know, um, you know. So the original bat days or the original cap days, stuff like that. Um, it, it, it used to be any anybody who would come. In the first cap day that I did in that I was involved in. And because we promoted like hell, I mean, I, I got an opportunity to advertise, you know, first. And so we wound up um, and you can look back, I think it was in, in 77, we had a giant Dodger game that we wound up drawing 48,000 people. 
which had never happened. And the people just kept coming, kept coming. And, you know, the, 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 in center field at Candlestick, all of a sudden it started to fill in. And we ran out of caps early, but we had these cards that were printed up that we could give to people that they could, you know, mail back and we would send them a cap, which cost us a fortune. But um, we just didn't want to disappoint anybody. Thank you very much, Pat, Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Norm. Russ, you're up. Russ B. Unmute, Russ. About that. Pat, I, uh, I'm Russ and uh, hey. another Russ, but uh, I'm uh, uh, working the tours department. So thank you for creating tours a number of years ago. And uh, one of the questions that we talk about a lot are the statues at the ballpark and who would be the next who uh who should be the next statue uh, my feeling is that there should be a statue for peter mcgowan and i was wondering what you think about that well i i i i would totally agree with you i don't know whether that's going to happen but um you know it, it the the giants would not be in san francisco if it hadn't been for him and it wasn't his it wasn't him just writing a check he had to incur he had to gather this group of rich investors together and keep them together and figure out a way to um, to build something that would stand the test of time. Um, so I, I'd say it would be Peter. I don't know who, I mean, there's going to be a statue out there for Barry at some point. Um, you know, anybody who's a, uh, so I don't really know who the additional statues might be, but, but I'd say if, if they, they ever thought that it would be uh, appropriate to do one for Peter, um, I would, um, I, I would totally be there and, you know, I would, I would do something different for him. I would have him, you know, not necessarily like pointing, I'd have him sitting in the seats or doing something that was sort of different that, um, you know, for that, I, I mean, I thought the Gaylord Perry's, I thought it would have been cool if I'd, I thought the Gaylord Perry statue should have been a fountain, you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean how, how cool would that have been, you know, to have that, but and, you know, when, when we put the Juan Marichal statue out there by, you know, it's out there by the left of Dill Bridge and we're there and, and we, we were doing it and he's, you know, he's got the high leg kick. And I told him, I had him believe in this. I said, you know, the left of Dill Bridge right over there. I said, we pull this lever and when the bridge goes up, your, your leg goes up. When the bridge goes down, your leg goes down. And I actually had him going for a while, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Well, I've taken you know, a lot of notes gonna... to share with what I, I was taking a lot of notes to share with a fellow tour guide. So this has been great. Well, you know what? If you want, I'll, I'll come because I'd love to give that tour someday because there's a lot of stuff about that ballpark that nobody knows about. But I, you know, while I still have a few marbles, I can uh, uh, I can do that. So I'm, I'd am i love to do that if I could come and uh, and sit with the tour guides and just share some stuff that maybe they can add to their presentation. All right. Well, we've got a meeting at the beginning of April, so we will. Uh, Tell the uh, the people in charge that uh, uh, to give you a call it would be fabulous. Great, Pat. Pat, before I go to Jim, um, <clears throat> Peter McGowan was, was a member of our group, and you know, for, he was fabulous. And besides, you know, being this multimillionaire, he was an everyday guy. When your stadium was getting started, I I I sent him a letter, and he sent me these. Exactly. You mentioned that film, which I saw that I think uh, Bob Costas actually narrated. Bob Costas. I asked Bob Costas to narrate it and he did it for free. So so Peter sent me the pictures of the stadium, colored shots. And he just said, basically, this is going to be the best ballpark in the United States. Please see me whenever you can when you get out here. He was just that he was just just a lovely man. And really. he would write these detailed letters to fans. I mean, his capacity for, for doing that, for work, was just awesome. And he he would do that. And, uh, um, you know, that's what, one of the things we miss is that uh, I wish he was still around to, yeah. to be able to enjoy it. He was a wonderful man. Judge, you're up. Thanks, Gary. Uh, and thank you, Pat. Pat, you talked a lot about the pieces of the financial puzzle as he put this together and the health of an organization, but I don't think I heard you'd mention TV money. And I thought, if you, do you have any comments about that? And well, uh, yeah, I mean, how that's generated. 
You know, I mean, it, it, if you look at the the amount, again, I'm not a fin finance guy, but I was in, in charge of, you know, making, you know, filling up the pot of, of these different revenue sources. You know, television, um, when I started, we televised 30 away, 30 away games. And um, so that was a, you know, that was a, a revenue source. Uh, everybody was afraid to televise a home game, um, but we eventually got over it and, and then almost televised every game. But the form of distribution where you could get a rights fee from, you know, like a local station like KTVU or, or or somebody like that, those days are sort of gone. There's so many ways to distribute content now that um, it is it's going to be it's going to be a challenge for the people going forward on it. So I don't know what the ratio is now. I've been away from it for enough between ticket sales, broadcast, broadcast, which I'd say radio, television, and the other versions of television, uh, licensing, merchandise licensing, never used to be a big category, but it, but it, you know, it's it's grown. Uh, food and beverage, the percentage you get from from a concessionaire um, is uh, is a key part of it, and um, you know the the. Uh, you know, so ticket sales and all that stuff, it's a balancing act to try to keep ticket sales, you know, it, it, nobody, hey, everybody always complains about beer prices. I, they complained about beer prices when beer was a dollar, you know, so that was, and that, you know what, that's your right as a fan to complain about all this stuff, you know, and it's, it's the giant's job to sort of, you know, try to put the best spin on it. But, you know, the, the point is you can, you can sit in a bar across the street and buy a beer for X amount you go into the ballpark, you're going to pay a lot more. Um, it's just sort of the way it is. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I, I think the, uh, the owner of the Atlanta Falcons did this thing called street pricing where he cut all of his concession prices. Cause he, that was his big beef. And then hey, eventually his people kind of made said, you know, Hey, we were leaving a lot of money on the table here. So eventually they, they started raising. As, as far as a revenue stream, I'm looking at like what the money that San Diego is spending right now. Yeah. Where's that coming from? Is that, I hear TV deals or I, I hear, is it out of the owner's pocket? Why are they seem to have some more financial flexibility than they should have, let's say? You know, and, and Peter Seidler, who's the principal owner of the Padres, you know, former um, part of the O'Malley family, you know, O'Malley grandsons, I think they finally determined that, in particularly in San Diego, where it's a really odd market because, you know, you've got the ocean to the west, you've got Mexico to the south, You've got cactus and tumbleweeds to the to the east, and you got LA to the north. You're sort of stuck there, and so for years they, you know, they they sort of try to run it like a business. When you see a sports owner say we're trying to run it like a business, you got a bad owner. Fans don't care about you running like a business; they want to see stars. And I think what they finally realized was they have to they have to be ready to pay to pay big money to do that. Now I don't know whether they have sleepless nights trying to figure out how to you know, how to sustain that. Um, you know, it was horrible when they paid that kid to tease all that money. And then the guy, then he gets bounced out and suspended. You know, I'm cheer I sort of cheering for the Padres in a way. I think, you know, they're in the entertainment business, but ask you where that money's coming from. I don't know. I have no idea. I'm not sure how they, I, I don't know that they, that, that they balance all the books. I mean, I don't really know, but it's a, uh, but I will tell you this, is that um, in order to maintain a fan base, the, ex the, the expectation is that you're going to compete. And baseball has got a problem that they're going to have to figure out a way to fix. That's It's a sort of a bigger sort of systemic, uh, I say problem. It's a problem, you know, it's a, it, it, worrying about the finances as a baseball fan is a great spectator sport in itself. You know, to watch guys like Scott Boris, who probably, you know, he's probably the most powerful guy in um, in, in baseball. And because, you know, he's, you know, if you're a player, you're cheering for a guy like that. So I, I, I wish I could tell you, I knew where that money was coming from for the Padres. I really don't, I really don't know how they're doing it. I think Thank I you. have an answer. Uh, I think the answer to that is the Padres are so close to Orange County and to LA. And when they're playing well, uh, if people are willing to drive 50 miles to a Giants game, they will go to a Padres game. So although San Diego is in one of the lowest markets, yeah. they're so close to big markets and they're drawing crowds from those Maybe. markets. It could be, but I, you know, I'd say, 
because only a portion of your whole revenue pool is from ticket sales, you know? So you gotta, you gotta be doing well in all the other stuff too. Renee, um, go ahead, you're up, Renee. Thank you. Um, Pat, this, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you, I really appreciate it. We all appreciate this. Um, and, and you know what? I, I had the f uh, fortune to uh, uh, meet uh, uh, Peter McGowan twice. Uh, with this group and the group beforehand. And one of the unique things I always found about him, and yeah, I agree, he should have a statue. But one of the other unique things about him, uh, Gary had said, he's a regular guy, is uh, his fandom from New York. He's from New York. Fortunately that he came to San Francisco to do what he's done uh, and to bring history to the Giants. Um, I mean, you know, the what he's done with, with the jerseys, uh, 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 bringing New York history. My question to you is, um, you know, I, I have not been to the ballpark, so I don't know. Um, I would love to hear stories about, I mean, I've heard a little bit, but nothing concrete about, you know, a Hall of Fame, uh, the New York years, the, San Francisco, the early San Francisco years, all confined. You know, I, I kind of hear it, it's all over the place. Yeah. Is there any thoughts about kind of like consolidated in a well? It is. Room in a huge let me tell, let me tell you the sort of the horrible truth about Hall of Fames. They're all money losers. They're all museums that lose money. And unless you've got a gigantic endowment, I mean, the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown is. I mean, they they get money from other sources, but you know, people got to go all the way the hell up to Cooperstown, New York, to see the Hall of Fame. And you know, it. So I, I think. Our, our strategy was to try to spread it around in the ballpark so that there were all different types of, uh, so rightly or wrongly, I think Hall of Fames um, as sort of standalone Hall of Fames wind up being sort of dusty museums that are just really, really expensive to curate and stuff. So that's that's why I don't think you, you see too many. Um, you know, the famous uh, uh, museum of of news and commerce in in Washington D.C., the museum, fantastic place. They closed a couple of years ago because they couldn't keep it. They, they just couldn't keep it going. So I, anyway, I, I mean, I, I, I get what you're saying. I'm a big history guy, so when I yeah. go to a play, I mean, I'm the first to go. Maybe it's me or a few out, others out there. But yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it's it's rich history. How far go? How uh, it how, is how, back the it, team it, goes. And, I don't know. I think you got to strike a balance. I mean, that's why that's why I think um, we our whole thing was we we'd have the history in and around the ballpark, so it would make the ballpark experience richer um, to go do that. Um, and we've heard we've heard that no, oh, there's no there's no Hall of Fame that's whatever. I I think there was a reason. There really was a reason for that. We just I can't remember that we could we could never figure out a way to make to make the unless we had somebody who one owner who was wealthy who wanted to bankroll it and endow it but we just never had that so we always wanted to kind of sprinkle the history around um rightly or wrongly okay thank you thank you harvey why don't you uh bring us home well uh i was fascinated mesmerized by your talk oh. but i i you put in my mind when you mentioned uh boris being the most uh influential name in the game where would you put steve Cohn of the new york mets well you know what i've never met mr Cohn. i think neither you know, have i god bless god bless him for coming in i mean what the mets have been through and, and, and i don't the, the will ponds are very very nice people they were very very nice people you know from the double days to the to the will ponds and all that stuff and you know will pond got stuck in that all that made off stuff and so and so they were been disappointing their fans for many, many years. So to have a guy like Steve Cohen who came in, um, who, you know, he's just this, you know, all of a sudden now he's become a hero. And, uh, you know, I, hey, I, I think it's I don't know. I think it's good for the game. It makes it you want you, you always want to have a dragon to slay. You know, anybody <laughs> that talks about parody in sports is not a marketing person. Parody in sports is boring as hell, but if you got to have a, a dragon to slay, like the, the Yankees have always been the dragon that everybody wants to slay. And now all of a sudden in New York, you've got the Mets who all of a sudden are, are, are making the Yankees, 
you know, okay, we're, we're, we're playing with the big boys. So it makes it into a more interesting um, thing to follow and to be involved with. But I think Steve Cohen, guys like Steve Cohen, um, and he's going to take his lumps as he goes forward. Um, but I think it's, I think it's good for the game to have people who are willing to compete. And, uh, you know, I don't know where the, all this financial stuff is going to go, but I think the, um, uh, they're see the, 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 let's look this way. The value of these franchises continues to go up. So there's mm -hmm. people who want to be involved in it. So, uh, I told you, I'm not a financial guy. I'm a marketing guy. So I think it's good marketing to, to have a guy like Steve Cohen. Pat, keep coming back. Before we wrap it up, is there anybody on board who didn't ask a question who wants to ask a question? Bill, go ahead. One quick thing. Great presentation, Pat. When you were trying to pitch the banks and areas, didn't anybody realize that the value of the real estate was going to go through the roof once you built the stadium in that neighborhood? I mean, what are buildings going for now? Hey, you know what? Bankers are your friends as long as you have money. Or as long as you have wherewithal. But I'm sorry if any of you are bankers. I, I'm, I'm sp maybe speaking, but Bank of America was our hometown bank. They were, and those guys basically told us to take a hike because wow. we wanted them to do that and stuff. So I don't, I, I, I can't answer you know, that question. We wound up doing it another way with a consortium of lenders, but um, it is a, uh, uh, you know, and now all of a sudden our <laughs> our little bank here, Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah. Oh, but you took yeah. a deserted neighborhood and you revitalized it into one of the biggest areas. You know, it's amazing. Yeah, yes, that's true. But it's kind of like, it's what have you done for us lately? You know? Right. <laughs> and also we were the catalyst. That ballpark was the catalyst for a development. Exactly. Yeah. That had been on the books for like 30 years. We were like the catalyst for that. And you know what? We The, the, the thing that we always would drive ourselves crazy is we wish we had more room out there. But what I've learned in this whole thing is you always... You always run out of money before you run out of ideas. And we, we it would have been nice to have more property, more land, um, but we didn't have it. So we had to we had to make do with what we had. Well, you did a great job. Thank you. Gentlemen, let's all give it up for Pat Gallagher. Pat, really it is fabulous, entertaining, fun. I'm happy to I'm happy to come back at some point. I also will make the offer. <laughs> Anybody who didn't get one of my bobbleheads who wants one i'll send it you just got to let gary know absolutely uh, pat i have a burning question yeah uh do you have any insight some teams own their own networks i believe the yankees and mets own their own networks <laughs> do you know what percentage uh that the giants own of the comcast network well it's a the giants do own their own uh regional the uh, controlling interests of the regional sports network i don't know what the percentage is but is different than any of the other franchises who are involved in it. And it was one of the things I got to hand, hand it to Larry Bear, who negotiated that deal. Um, they had to have the Giants. And Larry was smart enough to realize that um, we wanted to be, you know, we wanted to be an owner and stuff. So, but I, I don't know the percentage. And, the, and what's fascinating about all this stuff now, because there's so many new ways of distributing content, a lot of the things that we all, all used to think were you know, like bedrock, all that stuff's going out the window. So um, it's going to be, it's going to bear watching. I didn't, you know, I, who the hell knew what streaming was a few mm -hmm. years ago? Do you, mean, do you feel that now that they own the land across from a Covey Cove, where they had to increase uh, low income housing to double the percentage, roughly from 17 to 37 percent, what won't that enrich the team to buy, you know, higher priced free agents to compete? Maybe I I don't know I, it's a good question I don't I don't know that 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 you know that's a, that sort of an apples and oranges uh, comparison I think that the neighborhoods filling in certainly filling in and the Giants I mean I don't know that we could have done this whole thing you know we, we certainly if we were in the uh, process of doing it we couldn't do it today um, the 49ers couldn't figure out a way to get a new stadium built in San Francisco so they wound up build they wound up leaving town and building one in. Uh, Santa Clara. So I, I, I wish, so, you know, sometimes timing is everything in life. And I yes. think the timing for the Giants at that particular time uh, worked in our favor. Pat, thank you so thank you. much again. 
Anybody again interested in this fine piece of uh, hard work? <laughs> Get in touch with me, and uh, we'll, we'll. I have one. <laughs> Pat, let's all give it up for Pat Gallagher. Thank you. Thank you. Pat, don't be a come back. Come back. Uh, I will. I am going to hang out for a few minutes. Uh, but good night, everybody. We'll see you two weeks from yesterday, the 29th, with Rob Garrett and his uh, talk about um, Charles Stoneham. Yeah. Don't miss that one. He As just H. spoke Schein. to my group. He's uh, he's terrific. The knowledge he's and his stories. Yep. Good night, everybody. We'll see you. Good night. Ken, great seeing you, man. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Great job, Gary.